Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the Government of Newfoundland and Labrador's COVID-19 update for today, Wednesday, April 28th. I'll turn things over now to Dr. Fitzgerald for the latest update. Dr. Fitzgerald. Thank you, Premier. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Since media yesterday, we have four new confirmed cases of COVID-19 in our province, all related to travel. Three cases are in Western Health. Two individuals are between the age of 40 and 49, and one between the age of 20 and 29. One case is an individual between the ages of 40 and 49 in the Central Health Region. The total number of cases in our province is now 1,066. There has been one new recovery in Eastern Health, leaving 27 active cases in the, in the province. One person is in hospital due to COVID-19, and a total of 132,455 people have been tested to date. While our recent cases are related to travel or are close contacts of known cases, the majority are variants of concern. In cases identified during April, 83% of sequence samples have been positive for a variant of concern. These include nine cases with B117, the variant first identified in the UK, five cases of B1351, which was first identified in South Africa, and one case of P1, which was first identified in Brazil. We have also recently detected one case of the variant of interest first identified in India, B1617. This is a reflection of what we are seeing across the country and the world right now, as variants are becoming more prominent in the epidemiology everywhere. Variants of concern are mutations of the original COVID virus that can have a greater adverse effect on human health. And this may be because they're more, trans more easily transmitted or they cause more severe illness. They may be less controllable by vaccination or can even evade detection by our current testing methods. Variants of concern have changed the way we have to approach this pandemic. I know that it may be difficult to understand why we need to tread so carefully when we have so few COVID cases ourselves, but we are one of the few jurisdictions in Canada that is not experiencing community spread at this time. This virus is at our doorstep, however, waiting to be let in, and we have to do all we can not to let that happen. Importation is our biggest risk right now. We have layers of protection in place for travelers, including stringent self-isolation requirements, as well as enhanced testing. But with COVID, there are never any guarantees. The prevalence across the country, combined with more variants of concern at this time, means we've really never been at more risk than we are right now. We just need to look to the West to see how quickly things can spiral out of control and how devastating the consequences can be. Individuals with COVID are contagious before they have symptoms, and by the time a case is detected, it has likely already spread to close contacts and beyond. We can never be certain where the virus is or where it is not. The two most important things that everyone can do is to keep their contacts low and be diligent in adhering to public health guidance. Limit close non-essential interactions to those in our steady 20, and remember people, space, time, and place. The evidence tells us when we have fewer contacts, the virus has less chance to spread. The closer we are to people, the greater the risk of transmission. So stay six feet apart from people who are not in your close, consistent contacts. The more time we spend in close contact with people, especially in indoor spaces, the higher the risk of transmission. And we know that outdoor spaces are much safer than indoor settings. <clears throat> Wearing a mask has never been more important than it is now, and you should wear your mask whenever you're in the presence of others who are not in your steady 20. We are one of the few places in Canada <coughs> where team sports can still be played, but it needs to be done in a safe manner by minimizing contacts. Games can only proceed when their return to play plan has been submitted and received approval. Tournaments are not permitted because they significantly drive up the number of close contact, contacts for each individual. I caution any organizer of a sporting, cultural, or performance event to look look into what's permissible before the planning begins. While we do have guidance available on our website, if there is any uncertainty, please reach out to officials in the Department of Health and Community Services or the Department of Tourism, Culture, Arts and Recreation for clarification. We all need to have patience and remember that our country and our world is going through an extraordinarily difficult time right now. Everyone needs to do their part to keep our province safe. 
When we get a significant proportion of our population vaccinated, and when we see an improvement in epidemiology, we will look at easing restrictions. We're just not quite there yet. We have administered approximately 166,000 doses of vaccine to date, and there will be an open call for all healthcare workers with direct patient contact this week, and regional health authorities are still on track to issue an open call for the remainder of phase two priority groups no later than May 14th. Labrador Grenfell Health has already begun immunizing the remainder of its phase two priority groups. And as a reminder, once you become eligible, you are always eligible. You will not miss out. As a recap for those who may have just joined us, we have four new confirmed cases since yesterday's media advisory, and the total number of cases in the province is 1,066. We need to take this day by day, take care of yourselves and one another, have patience as we work together to keep COVID at bay and hold fast Newfoundland and Labrador. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Fitzgerald. I want to begin today by saying how proud we all are, not just of the frontline workers who left yesterday to help at the COVID units in Ontario, but also proud of each and every one of you, of us, for our continued vigilance to keep the number of COVID cases in Newfoundland and Labrador so low while the rest of the country is in peril. As we watch our friends and family members in other parts of Canada and around the globe struggling, we know that by continuing to follow the public health guidelines from Dr. Fitzgerald and her team, we are then doing our part to keep the virus at bay. There's nothing stronger than the bonds forged by those who face adversity together, and we are doing just that. So let's continue to lean on each other in these tough times. Another month is almost over, almost one third of the way through 2021, hard to believe. Understandably, people are getting tired of COVID and the way it has changed our lives. We all feel it. But with that said, I'm forever hopeful that as the number of people here at home and beyond are vaccinated, things will start to return to normal. Knowing that over 150,000 people in this province have already been received their first dose of vaccine is so encouraging. But please remember, that while we are still able to move about more freely by comparison to others, we can only do so if we continue to abide by the basic rules of wearing a mask, washing your hands, keeping distance, and following those critical travel protocols. So please, let's keep it up. Before I turn things over to Minister Hagee, I, I would be remiss if I did not take a moment to mention that this is a national day of mourning a day set aside to remember those who lost their lives on the job. A moment of silence was observed at 11 o'clock this morning. If you haven't done so, I encourage you, please take a moment. Think of those who lost their lives and the loved ones they left behind. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Hagee for some brief remarks. Minister Hagee. Thank you very much, uh, Premier, and uh, before I start my comments, I'd like to echo uh, yours about National Day of Mourning uh, and recall that uh, only recently a healthcare worker in British Columbia lost their life uh, from COVID-19 uh, as a result of uh, what I gather was workplace uh, exposure. Uh, again, shout out to Team Ontario, uh, a small but mighty group have uh, gone to uh, to help our neighbours just as uh, they help us uh, with our health care uh, the rest of the year round. Uh, we still have four new cases today and 27 active, but our case rates are remaining low. 3.1 per 100,000 this week, pretty much the same uh, as the previous week. To put that in context, the Canadian average for this week is 149.4. And in Alberta, it's 254 per 100,000. Fort McMurray, uh, a, a town where we have lots of connections, uh, is actual fact now receiving extra doses of vaccine from the Alberta Health Service to try and help uh, deal with um, uh, a flare-up of the disease there. And, and I'm hearing stories that camps are actually closing prematurely and sending their workers home. Um, Dr. Fitzgerald gave a, a breakdown of the variants. Um, similarly, uh, with our last week's new cases of the 16, 12 were related to travel. Three were contacts of those travelers and one is still under investigation. So importation does remain uh, our, uh, our main challenge uh, and vigilance 
as referenced by both Dr. Fitzgerald and the Premier, are really important. It only takes a slip. We have done so well for so long, uh, and it's important that we try and keep that up because the end is potentially in sight. In terms of vaccinations, uh, as uh, Dr. Fitzgerald referenced, over 166,000 doses administered thus far, which is 88% of the vaccine that we have had delivered. Uh, the deliveries will continue to ramp up now next week, uh, and we are in a position to administer whatever we get. We have contingency plans against what we hope will be a larger influx uh, in uh, early to mid-May possibly as many as a quarter of a million doses. Uh, in terms of the people of the province who are vaccinated, we've now hit the 33% mark with people having at least one dose. It is eight weeks away from our target to have everybody in the province vaccinated with one dose, and there is no reason for us to believe that we will not make that target. And by September, everybody who is eligible, who wants to, could be fully vaccinated. That will be a game changer uh, as long as between now and then we can hold the line, as Dr. Fitzgerald would say. Uh, she mentioned specific groups that will be on open call uh, and we're well into our plans for phase two. Uh, so hold the line. We can get there and we're eight weeks away from everybody having a first dose. Thank you very much, Premier. Well, thank you, Minister. I'll now invite uh, questions from the media. Thank you, Premier. For the benefit of our speakers, there are five reporters registered for today's call. The question and answer session will be conducted in two rounds, where each reporter will have the opportunity to ask one question and one follow-up per round. Following this, I will ask each reporter if they have one final question. Our first questions are from Peter Cowan with CBC. Please go ahead. Dr. Fitzgerald, other Atlantic provinces are also very concerned about importation. Uh, we've seen PEI is now testing everyone who enters three times over the course of their isolation. Uh, we have extra testing capacity here. Why aren't we doing something similar? Um, so we are looking at how we can uh, increase testing and, uh, and to uh, aid in our, our border um, measures. And uh, we have introduced up to this point increased testing for rotational workers and essential workers. Um, and uh, yeah, we're looking through what we need to do. But, you know, it takes a bit of planning. We want to make sure logistically it works and, uh, and that uh, we have a system that can be uh, monitored effectively. So uh, we're just taking a bit of time to make sure we do it right. Looking at New Brunswick, they are putting in mandatory hotel quarantine for anyone arriving in the province. Is Newfoundland and Labrador considering something similar? Um, we're looking at everything right now and uh, just trying to find the, uh, or trying to decide which one will work best for us. But uh, so when we have more information on that, we certainly will let you know. But, uh, you know, everything is under consideration at this point. Thanks. Our next questions are from Kellyanne Roberts with NTV. Please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Premier. We've sent help to Ontario after um, some conversations between Doug Ford and, and his call for that help. We're now seeing Nova Scotia uh, experiencing a third wave with the military having gone there. Are we looking to provide any help to them on any level? Well, I spoke with the Atlantic Premiers last night, including Premier Rankin, and uh, we uh, discussed our uh, capacity and, and, and how we could help collectively within the Atlantic region. And as I understand it, we've offered uh, testing capacity. Uh, they are uh, reaching the limits of their testing capacity, as we did during that peak in February here. So we're offering testing capacity uh, to them as well. With respect to personnel, um, of course, you know, we have always said that we have limited capacity, and right now that's being uh, used uh, in Ontario. And Dr. Fitzgerald, as we're seeing other jurisdictions experience a third wave and it's potentially knocking on our door here, do you feel that people are becoming too complacent with our low case count? Um, I, don't, I don't know if people are becoming more complacent, but uh, I certainly would take the opportunity to reiterate that we should not become more complacent. Um, you know, it, it is... What we were seeing across the country could happen here at any time. It just... You know, our border measures are strict. We've relied on them very heavily. Um, and uh, that 
can help to stop cases from getting here. Our quarantine measures can stop cases from getting out, but at the same time, uh, cases can get out as we have seen in the past. And, and so the only thing that stops that spread throughout our communities is if people are adhering to those public health measures that we recommend, which is keeping your contacts low, trying to keep your contacts to only essential contacts, um, making sure that you're wearing your mask when you're outside, maintaining your physical distancing, um, washing your hands well, all of those things are really important to help reduce your risk. But, you know, our travel measures can help stop COVID from getting here, uh, but the things we do after it gets here are really what stops it from spreading. So that's why we all have to, uh, to remember our public health measures, especially keeping your contacts as low as you can. Thank you. Our next questions are from Peter Jackson with The Telegram. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Fitzgerald, it's no secret that uh, uh, Pfizer stands by its three-week interval uh, on doses and said so in a statement last month that they have no evidence to, to back the recommendation for longer intervals. What do you say to people um, who contact us as well who are worried about waiting so long for their second shot? So uh, when Pfizer says it doesn't have evidence, it doesn't mean that there isn't evidence. It means Pfizer doesn't have the evidence. It hasn't done the studies to look at that. So you, you've got to remember that there is still real world evidence out there that says that it appears that uh, certainly we know uh, at around two months, people have a, a good response to um, the first dose of the vaccine. And knowing what we know about vaccine science and the way that our bodies respond to vaccines, the chances of that, that protection uh, dropping off rapidly in the next two months would be quite low, which is why NACI um, has made the recommendation that it has about the expanded dose interval, uh, or extended dose interval, sorry. So we certainly, um, you know, NACI is a, a body of uh, national experts. Uh, who look at all of this and have been looking at it for years, uh, and certainly uh, we we do um, align with their um, with their recommendations. Um, we, you know, in the evidence that's coming out in a lot of places right now is showing that um, that that protection is holding. So, okay, um, and as well, um, another question that's circulating is. Uh, Concern over future deliveries of Covishield from India. That's obviously in doubt since they have them on hold. What are the contingency plans for those who already have their first shot? Can they take a, a different AstraZeneca version? Um, yes, yeah, so it was certainly we know that uh, the two are very similar. Um, so, you know, we, we certainly endeavor as much as we can to use the same product the second time round. Um, but uh, if not, then we, we do have those contingency plans. There are studies that are ongoing now to see if we can combine um, the, the second shot be different than the first shot, uh, to be a different product than the first shot. Um, so we hope to have those, uh, uh, the results of those studies in the, in the coming weeks, um, probably be early June before we get it, but um, that will help to inform our decisions about what we have to do with that. Uh, but the, you know, the recommended dosing range is, is uh, 12 to 16 weeks for AstraZeneca. So we do have a bit of time to think about that. Thank you. Our next questions are from Richard Duggan with BOCM. Please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fitzgerald, the variant of interest that you mentioned, um, what makes something a variant of interest versus a variant of concern? What's the difference? Um, so variant of concern is, we know that there is a, an adverse effect on on human health and a variant of interest is just basically there's a potential that it could. It may have some mutations that are similar to mutations in a variant of concern. Um, and uh, so there is a potential that it could have an effect on, on human health, but the evidence just uh, is not there yet, basically. And, uh, um, and some um, variants of interest never become a variant of concern, and then some do, such as the three that we have right now that are variants of concern. So. And uh, as you mentioned, three variants of concern, one variant of interest. Uh, this news will undoubtedly uh, be disheartening to some. Uh, what do you say to those who are feeling a heightened sense of anxiety hearing this news? Uh, so, you know, I think we have to realize that 
um, this is not unexpected. Um, that's what's circulating everywhere else. We know that B117 is the predominant strain in Ontario, it's the predominant strain in Alberta and a couple of other uh, provinces um, in the country. Um, and so, you know, when most of our cases are coming from travel within the country, um, it's inevitable that we're going to see these cases and they're going to be related to a variant of concern. Uh, we know that there are variants of concern. Uh, the uh, 1351 is circulating in a lot of um, in areas across the country, but also in a lot of areas in the world, um, and the P1 variant as well. So uh, these are, it's inevitable that we will get cases of these, and uh, um, so that's why it's even more important right now to, be, to make sure that we're uh, really um, stringent with our public health measures. We have to remember that we all still have the power to be able to reduce the risk of transmission of this virus, and, and that just means adhering to those public health measures. So the power is still with us. Thank you. Our next questions are from Antonio Whalen with The Independent. Please go ahead. Thank you. Is there any update this week on the number of vaccines that have been considered to have been wasted in the province due to technical or other reasons? I'll leave that for you, Minister. Yeah. I don't have any further update from the number I gave you last week, which was just over the 200 mark, but I can certainly go back and ask the question for you. Thank you. And what factors are being considered by the province when determining a suitable age range for a vaccine, such as the current age restrictions for the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine in this province? Um, so the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, NACI, has uh, made some recommendations. Uh, and they have looked at, um, you know, the risk of COVID, uh, severe disease from COVID versus the risk of um, the VIT, um, potential VIT side effect from AstraZeneca. And they have made re recommendations for use um, based on, on that. And so it, it really does depend on, on the risk of uh, contracting COVID and developing severe disease. Um, and, you know, when you're in a um, province with low prevalence, <coughs> that uh, the risk of, um, the risk is lower for contracting COVID, thankfully. Um, and so we have to take that into consideration when we're uh, making that decision. So right now, 55 is where we've landed, and, uh, and that's where we're going to stick um, for the foreseeable future. If things change, if our epidemiology suddenly changes and we have higher prevalence, then we can look at reducing that age. Um, you know, if, if the risk of um, uh, contracting COVID and developing severe disease is, uh, outweighs uh, the risk of the VIT. Thank you. Our next questions are from Peter Cowan with CBC. Please go ahead. We saw early on that uh, people in this province are quite eager to get the vaccine, and we saw, for example, people sharing their registration codes um, to get people booked when they shouldn't have. Right now, if you book a vaccine, you say you're a rotational worker or you're clinically vulnerable, you don't have to show any proof. It's basically on the honor system. So how do we know that people aren't just checking the box to get a shot even though they don't qualify? This is probably best for the minister, but first of all, that's a good thing. There's so many people who want vaccines. Let's try to keep that narrative going throughout the, the public domain. But, Minister, go ahead. Uh, it is very much on the honor system. Quite frankly, we do ask for ID, uh, and uh, that ID is, uh, is documented so that we can keep a vaccine record and we'll know uh, the uh, appropriate vaccine to administer on their, uh, their second dose. Uh, the fact is... Uh, our aim is to vaccinate as many people as we can, given our vaccine supply. Uh, and really, and honestly, it is on the honor system. Uh, if you are not a rotational worker and you choose to jump the queue, then is a rotational worker who's been left behind for a week or so. And Dr. Fitzgerald, what would you have to see either elsewhere in the country or in this province in order for you to start instituting more stringent uh, restrictions? Um, so, you know, restrictions here with regard to lockdown restrictions or gathering sizes and that sort of thing would very much depend on spread of virus within our communities here. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if we, I mean, what we're seeing right now really is, uh, is enough to make us want to relook uh, at our border measures and testing. So I think that's one thing, like what's happening now is certainly making us reconsider where, 
what we will be doing uh, in the future. So um, <coughs> it's uh, uh, certainly uh, if we're seeing continued um, uh, rise in cases, if we're seeing uh, increasing um, amounts of uh, um, importation, um, and if we start to see that that importation is is leaking out, shall we say, be of uh, uh, you know a household, then uh, then certainly we'll be having to look at more stringent uh, measures, which you know uh, we saw in uh, New Brunswick over the past week. Thanks. Our next questions are from Kellyanne Roberts with NTV. Please go ahead. Thank you. Other jurisdictions have added type 2 diabetes to the clinically extremely vulnerable list. Are we looking to do something similar here in Newfoundland and Labrador? Uh, did you say type, di two, type, two. type 2 diabetes? I mean, not at this time. Our clinically extremely vulnerable uh, group is as it is right now. Um, certainly, uh, you know, we have a higher rate of diabetes here. Um, so um, I think at this point we will probably get uh, most people with diabetes just as quickly by going down through um, an age-based uh, process. Thank you. Is there any indication how far through phase two we are at this point now that we've opened up um, the call for vocational workers, truck drivers, and air crews, and now adding for the healthcare workers to come this week? Yeah, so I think the, uh, you know, after this, it's uh, essential workers, and, uh, and then that's phase two. So good news. Thank you. Our next questions are from Peter Jackson with the Telegram. Please go ahead. Sorry, it's still on mute. Um, uh, what, uh, Dr. Pichero, what do you make of the new CDC guidelines? They're making a big deal in the U.S. about not having to wear masks outside now. But what, what situations would you say um, they should be worn outside here, if at all? I mean, at this point, we know that outside activities are safer than um, inside activities, and we haven't been recommending masks to be worn outside um, up to this point. Certainly, if we were starting to see significant community spread, that might be something that we consider. And, you know, in a lot of areas in the U.S., they had really significant community spread, and so uh, that's why they were making those recommendations. But um, at this point um, here, we don't, we don't thankfully see that. So... Um, uh, yeah, it would it would have to be uh, you know significant spread and um, uh, but at that point really you shouldn't be gathering and be worrying about um, um, getting together anyway if we have that <laughs> situation. So I don't know. <laughs> it's more really about hopefully don't, uh, we don't get there. Yeah, and hopefully we never get there. But it would really be uh, there would be a, a lot of measures that would be in place if uh, if we're considering having people wear masks outdoors. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, the the self isolation rule uh, in terms of separating um, from others. If you have someone in the house that's symptomatic and you only have one bathroom, is there any way to to consider that um, to separate quarters, or does everyone have to isolate in that? Case? Um, so, are you asking if someone is symptomatic with? Um with COVID? In a household, yes. If someone and, is symptomatic, and, and they only have one bathroom. If someone's in a household with COVID, then the whole house is isolating anyway, because they're all close contacts. Oh. So they'll all be isolated. Okay. Oh, okay, but in isolation, I meant isolation without being symptomatic. What, what, how does that one bathroom fit into the so, uh, scenario? Is it possible so to successfully if, isolate away? If someone is COVID positive, regardless if they have symptoms or not, the whole household is isolating together. They're considered close right. contacts. Um, so is that is that what you're asking? No, if you, if you're or are you asking if someone is not symptomatic no, and if, just if isolating someone is because not symptomatic? I'm sorry, I misspoke. If someone is not, if there's no, if someone is isolating and technically having to isolate away without being symptomatic, what is that one bathroom imply? in terms so of the, whether they can do it or not. So, P Peter, the question is basically a rotational worker in isolation with so a family a only has one, yeah. only has sure. a one bathroom, correct? That's the kind yep. of scenario? Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. So, yeah, all right. So it's a person without COVID who's not been diagnosed. Okay. Is um, so, um, you know, if somebody is not having any symptoms, 
Um, certainly, if there's one bathroom, that does make it much more difficult to isolate. Um, there's no doubt about that. Um, it's hard to clean every surface, but I mean, that is the recommendation is that after the traveler, uh, for example, uh, would be, um, uh, you would use the washroom that, uh, that whatever surfaces they used would be cleaned, uh, whatever surfaces they touched would be cleaned, that people would stay away, the person would be wearing their mask if they go to the washroom, um, you know, I suppose separate from getting in the shower, but um, otherwise they'd be wearing a mask and not coming into contact with anybody. Uh, and it would have to be uh, pretty thoroughly cleaned in between um, uses. So uh, it would be a difficult chore for sure. Okay, thank you. Our next questions are from Richard Duggan with VOCM. Please go ahead. COVID cases are continuing to climb in the Alberta oil sands. Are changes anticipated when it comes to regulations re uh, related to rotational workers? Um, so as I said, we're looking at uh, travel um, restrictions now and, and looking at what options are available to us and what uh, or what we might uh, need to do. Um, and um, we'll probably have more information about that in the, in the coming days, but uh, we're certainly looking at everything at this point. And um, what kind of precautions are being put in place uh, on Marine Atlantic? Uh, for travel arriving now that Nova Scotia is in lockdown? So Marine Atlantic has had uh, quite strict uh, uh, measures in place since the beginning of the outbreak and uh, you know they have uh, they have very strict protocols for when people come onto the boat um, you know they go to their cabins they uh, they don't go to cafeteria um, there's plexiglass to separate workers from um, passengers um, and so they do have a lot of uh, procedures in place already um, to help protect um, uh, travelers and uh, you know we have testing protocols in place for the Marine Atlantic employees <coughs> as well so um, you know we, we certainly feel that we have um, uh, good protocols in place for the protection of uh, um, people here in the province. Thank you. Our next questions are from Antonia Whalen with The Independent. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, as of Monday, St. Pierre and Miquelon had zero active cases with 75% of the eligible population having received the first dose of the vaccine. So with this considered, is it looking like there's a possibility of a bubble forming with Newfoundland and Labrador? Well, thanks. That's a question that's currently being discussed at the federal level. Uh, certainly this is a, a, a Canadian-France border, obviously. Uh, and I spoke with Minister LeBlanc the other day about it, and this is something that uh, they're working through. Um, again, it depends on the epidemiology, but also not just the static epidemiology of St. Pierre and Miquelon, but uh, if they're having direct flights from France, just say, or if there's chance of uh, other entrance into uh, and onto the islands, then that would have to be something that would be considered. But again, this is a discussion between two countries, not a province and a country. But if the federal government uh, could uh, figure out a way, uh, again, as we've mentioned on this panel before, that the epidemiology was okay and it was safe, it was okay with Dr. Fitzgerald and her team, the province wouldn't be opposed to it should everything else line up. And if a bubble opens up between the province and a neighboring territory, would this look different than the last time, such as allowing only those who are fully or partially vaccinated having the ability to move freely within the bubble? Well, I think the bubble is certainly uh, something that uh, the Atlantic premiers are discussing, the chief medical officers of health are discussing. And right now, given the situation in Nova Scotia and, uh, and New Brunswick, uh, you know, it's, it's not something uh, that has been uh, fully uh, thought through. Conceptually, it's still, the bubble is still intact. But in terms of how we, uh, re we reintroduced the bubbling, so to speak. Uh, God, I wish we had picked a different name, but um, <laughs> we will uh, we will kind of adapt according to the epidemiology and the evidence that's uh, that's available. But it will certainly be a science-driven uh, uh, decision at the time, and all the Atlantic premiers are certainly on board with that. Thank you. I will now go back through each reporter to see if you have one final question. Peter Cowan with CBC. Do you have a final question? I do. Uh, we see travel advisories have been coming out on a fairly regular basis. How often does that actually lead to finding any additional cases? Um, 
I'm not aware of any in the recent uh, past. Um, you know, we do have situations where uh, we will have a couple of uh, uh, travelers on the same flight who actually um, get detected, but uh, I think that's more from a, uh, those have been more from a, a testing protocol point of view as opposed to the flight advisory. Um, I, I, uh, I would have to go back and confirm that, Peter, but I certainly don't recall any, any recently. Good, thanks. Kellyanne Roberts with NTV. Do you have a final question? Yes, thank you. The cases that were announced today, the four of them all being travel related, were they asymptomatic or symptomatic um, and then got testing due to sim symptoms or I guess what is the situation here? Uh, I don't have that information, uh, Kellyanne, but I can't really talk about uh, symptomatology of uh, patients due to health privacy reasons. Thank you. Peter Jackson with the Telegram. Do you have a final question? Uh, yes, I, I'm going to ask a question that I get asked a lot, uh, so I might as well bring it up again. Uh, what about people, first this is for you, Minister, what about people who cannot leave their homes? Do they call that vaccine number instead of registering online, or is that even available at home vaccinations? Uh, at home vaccinations are available. Um, Central Health are well advanced. The bulk of theirs are done, and I think Western Health are in a similar situation. Eastern Health were delayed because of some uh, logistical issues. They have a list which I think is around 200, uh, and they've begun to work their way through that. Uh, we've had some inquiries, and we've directed them. Uh, you can register in the normal way. Uh, by phone, and uh, when they contact you, uh, you should explain that you would require a home visit. Uh, and if there are any challenges, then you can go back through public health uh, and add your name to the list. So, uh, Eastern Health is the only um, the only region uh, where this has become an operational issue. It's gone pretty smoothly in the other areas on the island. Okay, thank you, Richard Duggan with BOCN. Do you have a final question? I do, thank you. Um, have any adverse or serious side effects been observed in anyone who has received the vaccine in this problem? Um, I, I don't have a breakdown of all of the uh, side effects that have happened or that have been reported, um, but uh, we certainly haven't had any severe um, side effects that I'm aware of. Uh, most of what has been reported would be expected. Um, so, uh, not, um, not to my knowledge at this point, but we can certainly uh, follow up, Richard. Thank you. Antonia Whalen with The Independent. Do you have a final question? Uh, yes, I do. Um, is the current standard recommendation in this province to wear a double mask or a single mask to protect against COVID-19? At this point, it's a single mask. Three layers are preferable, um, and that's, yeah, that's our recommendation now. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Premier, do you have any final comments today? Well, thank you all for joining us today. I'd like to uh, finish today's avail with this uh, thought. As I went to bed last night, I thought about those volunteers from here who are now on the front lines of the COVID crisis in Ontario. And I thought about Newfoundlanders and Labradorians' long-standing reputation of turning out both doers and givers. They were all a part of that tradition, and we could not be more proud. We owe them all a debt of gratitude. So stay safe, Newfoundland and Labrador, those that are here and those that are about the rest of the country.